All right, good evening. It's a Monday night instead of their typical Tuesday night, and we're going to have a special presentation tonight. We've been doing a lot with the movies lately, and that's all popular, and people are interested in that and whatnot. But we are going to do something a little more historically often, a little more historically oriented tonight. We are going to talk about the M1911, the infamous, or famous, either way you can slice it, the famous M1911 pistol, and all of the iterations of it throughout military service. And there's more than just two. I was surprised myself when I found out that there was more than two. But there are more than two. Tonight, it will be myself, Jeremy, the curator here at Ghost of the Battlefield, and Dave Hall, our resident expert on all things... <laughs> Expertish, <laughs> <laughs> and his amazing collection of 1911s. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of them piece by piece, and talk about the various small nuances of each one and how they differ from whatever the other previous models. But um, out here on the table before the show, this is just our showpiece. This is one of the Ghost of the Battlefields 1911s. This 1911 is number 54,000. It was made in 1913. And it was actually carried in France in 1917-18 by a member of the 102nd Engineers of my home state of New Jersey. It was my uncle by marriage's grandfather's. And it was procured by him after the uh, fighting had ended. It has also been featured in several of our How-To Clean videos. But before we get into all the history of the 1911, let me remind you that you can support us tonight with stars here on Facebook. That is one way we pay the bills here is through stars donations. Also, every click, like, share, help us out. And I am behind the computer tonight. We're going to do this in a tabletop style. So I can quickly ask, answer, and react to your questions over here on the other page. So if you have any questions, and I'm sure that we all will, I will be here to answer them for you. And with that whole thing being said, I will. Do you want Dave? Do you want me to leave this one here on the table for you? Or do you want to continue, or you want to start with one of your own? Yeah, we'll start with. Uh, we'll start with. We'll go back to the future. So we'll go back yeah, to the future. Pull, pull that one. Okay. Out. And without further ado, here is Dave. I'll be stepping out for a minute, and I'll be back. All right. How's how's that look? You're right in the middle. Right All right. So what this is, is uh, <clears throat> this is a, a gun that was made a few years ago. There were only 70, there were intended to be 100 of these made, but this is as close a representation of the first 500 guns that were delivered to the United States military in 1911 as you're going to be able to get. So uh, Bill Lawfridge, who's a good personal friend of mine, I, I learned gunsmithing from him um, a couple years before the 100th anniversary in uh, 2011 of the 1911 crept up on us. He wanted to do something special and he was looking around um, the industry and seeing what people were doing to commemorate uh, the 100 year anniversary and most people were just cranking out uh, more modern guns, maybe some of the classic styles, but they were doing some sort of scroll work on here that said something about 100 years. And Bill, uh, being the crazy pistol smith that he is, decided well he could do one better. So. What he did is he challenged himself to build part for part um, one a gun, 100 guns exactly like the first 500. And if you're impressed with the, the glossy finish, this is how they came back then. They were hand polished and they, they looked fantastic. Now the challenge that Bill had, he didn't he threw his uh, his gauntlet in the sand and then he and then he started doing his research and went, oh no, there were 19 unique parts that he was going to have to recreate that. Uh, that had been changed over the years from the original. And then he had to go find those 19 parts. And so I believe he was only, he was able to handle six original 1911s in the first 100 or first 500 guns that were delivered to the United States military. And the owners were uh, let him go inside the gun. So he could take them apart and look at all the par parts and compare them. And it was a good thing because not one of the six was 100% when it came to the parts, but between the six guns, he was able to get his hands on and get the uh, the dimensions and all the uh, particular uh, angles and things of the parts that had changed, and he recreated them in this gun. So his goal was to, we offered to do 100, and only uh, 70 
were completed uh, before the project ran its course. And this is number eight of that. There's a significance to that personally. I wanted the number eight and, and uh, it has an N tagged onto the end that designated Navy. The originals wouldn't have had that. Apparently someone named Sean knows where seal number 41 is located. Now. Of this batch? Oh, right on. Mm. Yeah. yeah, these things are amazing. So the features that I want to point out, <clears throat> and we're going to go back to why did this gun ever even come about? Semi-automatics were starting to, starting to be a thing, starting to be a possibility. And if you look, this is a turn-of-the-century technology gun. So in 1902, the, uh, the Army had some, uh, some bad experiences using the 38 revolver uh, in the Philippines uh, against the Moros, and they wanted more stopping power, and that, that wasn't getting it, getting it done. And also, uh, if semi-automatics could, uh, could work reliably, that was another feature that they wanted. So they commissioned some tests to look into increased lethality or, or, or nail down what cartridge did they want? And they, they'd had some, there we go. I'm gonna put that in there for, they'd had, uh, you know, the, in the Old West, the 45 Long Colt had served them pretty well. It was their cavalry weapon. And so 45, it wasn't, uh, as far as the caliber, wasn't unknown to them. The cartridge in ACP, of course, was new. And so that's where the famous, uh, and some people get all bent out of shape about it, but it's actually a pretty fascinating read. You could never do something like this today. But the uh, Thompson Lagarde tests in the Chicago stockyards of uh, 1904, and the resultant theories that came from that were basically that they don't want a bullet that's uh, less than 45 in caliber. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was funny. There's some sixes in there, so there's like it had, you know, it, it it's, there were some features that they're like, hey, it has to be this. But basically, they were just saying this is the this is the minimum. The minimum caliber needs to be 45, and they were shooting. Uh, they were shooting animals that were going to be put down to, to become meat. <laughs> nice. When you read how what what the test, you know where Let's they were what shooting. This one does. Them. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think I don't. I, not only PETA, I think your average human being would be like, whoa. Thank you, Senior Chief Roberts. As usual, we always appreciate your stars. <laughs> and uh, so they also had cadavers at their disposal. Nice. And they had uh, a unique way of hanging them and uh, measuring how much they moved when they were uh, absorbing bullets. And this was all part of their, their test. So as I said, very, uh, some people today would, would be uh, disgusted by what they did, but it, it, you know, honestly, it turned out a pretty interesting weapon system. Hmm. Now, around that time, what were, uh, what were the shock troops or the mobility troops? The cavalry. The cavalry. And what did the cavalry Which wear? is why you see the extreme elongated um, trigger guard on this particular pistol. All right, so here are some cavalry gauntlets. And so the design features on the original 1911 were meant to be implemented by a cavalryman who had to dedicate one hand to control the horse. Then he could shoot at his enemy with his other hand. Now you think of, th think of this in terms, and, and this goes back to probably why also they were like, hey, let's, let's do these testing on cattle because this was still in a day where you could disable and totally take out the mobility platform of your enemy with your handgun. Right. You can't take a Glock and shoot a Humvee and take it out with one shot. <laughs> well, which, you hope not. So, but just think how profound that is for a second. <laughs> That's a pretty big deal, right? Yeah. So we've long since passed those times. But to accomplish that, that's where some of these features are what they are. Uh, the big, wide and heavily checkered spur hammer on here is because you were going to be, if you had to thumb that thing, you were going to be doing it with these gauntlets on. More Those gauntlets are, they're, they're very limiting. I mean, they, <clears throat> they're designed to obviously protect your hands from mm -hmm. the reins of a horse and all of the rigors of the trail from barbed wire fences to uh, thickets and thorns and, and all those kind of things. But they're also very limiting in allowing your hand to even have any kind of real flexibility when it comes to uh, maneuvering them so mm -hmm. obviously you know you have to have a a mastery probably of how the how the trigger feels when you're riding and um there's just a lot of aspects to that whole thing I mean, we, we have a very nice cavalry display up front that we're working on currently and i, I love going through the old cavalry stuff it really 
I've, re I've really enjoyed learning about it. So the, the dimensions of things like the hammer and the the tang, the upper tang here on the grip safety, uh, we're all with that in mind. We're going to give these to our shock troops, the you know the the cavalry guys, primarily, and the double lanyard loop. So one was to retain the handgun. Yep. If you dropped it, and the other was to, so that if you dropped two of your magazines, <laughs> yeah. you at least had one magazine mm -hmm. retained on the lanyard to reel back in and reload. So, which seems like a pretty practical feature. Of course, you know this is when going into World War One. Mm -hmm. I always, you know, they always talk about the, the, the guns of August, the book where you know they had thought that the cavalry was going to show up and punch through these these lines, these defensive lines with their horses. And just war had changed to the point that, you know, a lot of the thoughts of the cavalry being the shock troops, being the uh, upfront troops, quickly evaporated in, in uh, a hail of gunfire on the Western Front. But the 1911, which was designed for that kind of battlefield, you know, stayed at the forefront of pistoling or pistoleering, if you want to call it that, for the next 60 years. So, so I want to give you on. two reference. I've got a huge library of 1911 related books, but. Two of the better ones. This one is a really great um, research source to, to look at the, the early government 1911s, when th certain numbers were produced and by whom and the different changes. And uh, this author goes into excruciating detail about that. And I use this as a go-to reference if I'm looking at maybe picking up a gun, especially if it's something that to me is an oddball and I want to know, hey, is this legit or, you know, when, together. yeah, yeah, exactly. What marking should I, you know, legitimately find on it? This one though is, uh, if you've not read this, shame on you. So this is uh, A Rifleman Went to War by Herbert W. McBride. So the background on this is, um, and it, I'll show you some stuff in here. This guy McBride, uh, he was a, I think he had joint U.S. Canadian citizenship and grew up in Indianapolis around the late 1800s. And uh, as a young man, he wanted to go experience the Wild West, so he became a surveyor for the railroads. And he was out, uh, out ahead, you know, several days ahead of the railroads as they were laying track doing the surveying for him. But he got to experience all these Old West towns and a lot of these Old West, famous Old West gunfighters were still alive and still hanging out in these towns. Mm -hmm. And he sought these guys out and, and he was really interested in gunplay. And by then it, they'd been written about. So he literally got to sit and talk with these guys and ask them about different aspects of gunfighting. And some of that stuff le leaks into this book. And if you've ever seen the book Trigonometry, these are almost companion books for that chapter of his life. But then later on, he hears somebody tell him, hey, there's going to be a war. And he goes, a war? Where? And he really wanted to experience a war. And they're like, in Europe. So he rode three days back to the uh, railhead, gets on the Morse, and, and it sends a message back to his family and says, hey, does, does America going to get in this war? And I said, nah, it doesn't look like it, but Canada is going to be in it because England's in it. Mm -hmm. So he sold his horse and tack, got on the train, took the train to Canada, and enlisted. And he actually was the one American who had the most combat experience in World War I uh, because he fought with the Canadians early on. And he went over, he became an infantryman, and he became a sniper. Later he got commissioned, and he, and he ran a machine gun section. So his, uh, his experience was all over the place, and, and uh, he has some great, great firsthand knowledge. But there's a whole uh, chapter in here about the pistol at war. And if you go to... <laughs> My book, when you, when you get to that, it's just all highlighted in here because there are some things that he said that, you know, he wrote this book after uh, World War I, he came back to the United States and in the mid or early 1920s, he wrote this book and he was uh, one of the people that they brought down to Fort Benning to, to uh, teach our soldiers uh, about war experiences over there because he had more than any of the Americans had mm -hmm. for me in there. So anyways, his, a lot of the things that he says, uh, particularly about the pistol, are timeless. They haven't changed. And he has a lot of detail about how they, I was really surprised how much they trained the for combat. The name of the book is A Rifleman Went to War by Herman McBride. Herbert. Herbert, Herbert. sorry, yep. Herbert McBride. Yeah. All right, so. This is my World War I, 1911. Um, 
and it was made in 1917. I looked it up. Um, I'm going to tell you an interesting story that happened just recently, as in a few years ago. So a mutual friend of mine and Bill Lawfridge, and if you actually want to see the people that I'm going to talk about tell the story, you can go to our uh, the Silent Warrior Foundation's uh, You're YouTube welcome, Mike. channel. And we, uh, we actually, all three of us that I'm about to talk about, tell the story of the gun with the actual gun that I'm about to talk about in, this, in the uh, video. So what ended up happening is a friend of ours was a, he was a uh, Vietnam attack pilot. He was shot down in 1965 and was a prisoner of war until he was released in 1973. And um, I went to meet him through a mutual friend. He and I became fast friends. And over time, he asked me if I could help him find his dad's 1911. So his, uh, his father died basically of a broken heart because he didn't know his, when he was shot down, he was, he, nobody saw him get out. So he was presumed killed. That's terrible. And, um, yeah, it was horrible. And so his father basically died of a, of anxiety and a broken heart, worrying about his son, um, uh, either being in captivity or killed. And <clears throat> as, and, and so when the father died, the father had this 1911 mm. that he used in world war one, not just any 1911, his father won the Distinguished Service Cross for single-handedly taking out three German machine gun nests. Wow. And was given a battlefield commission. And he was able to retain that 1911 that he used in that combat action. And my friend, who had been the, the attack pilot in mm -hmm. Vietnam, said he never saw his dad without that gun. And he said, he said actually, his, his father shot a guy to death that tried to rob him in Philadelphia. He had the bank, his father had the bankroll for the the company business and right. was going to, to uh, pay people or whatever, or take it to the bank. Somebody tried to hold him up and he did what he knew how to do. He whipped the same 1911 out and popped that guy without thinking about it and wow. put him down. So apparently my friend's younger brother inherited this because they all presumed he was dead. Uh -huh. Well, <clears throat> not long before I met this friend of mine. Is that the 1911? This isn't it, but it looks just like it. So if you want to see the actual story being told with the same, the real 1911 I'm talking about, uh, again, it's the Silent Warrior Foundation's uh, uh, YouTube channel. We got all of us together and talked about it. So, Mike, all, uh, th this is not the actual gun that popped the, the guy with the bankroll, but the, all of these 1911s have seen combat. Mm -hmm. There's no, there is absolutely no, no doubt about it. In fact, this one right here, I know for a fact, saw extensive service on the Western Front. I don't know if it has any bodies on it or not, but <laughs> it definitely got stolen. So the, the Virginia connection was that his younger brother uh, had been living in Manassas and he passed away. And uh, the family all knew that this guy would want his, his dad's gun. So it was waiting for him. And they sent me up there with Bill. Bill Lawfridge flew in from Nebraska and he and I drove up to Manassas and met this guy's uh, a wonderful family. And they handed over not just the 1911, but the holster the web belt, the the uh, holders for the wire cutters for going right. through the wire, all these, and, and three magazines. So sorry, John, uh, Dave is actually from the Navy, not from the Marine Corps, but I'm sure he appreciates your sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we took the gun uh, back here, and I was able, I had a good friend that was working at the Pentagon at the time, and I had them reissue his father's Distinguished Service Cross citation in the you know in the blue binder and everything, and then we had dog tags made up and we found he, he was in the the bloody bu bloody bucket uh, division the twenty eighth out of Pennsylvania, and so uh, we found where someone had uh, painstakingly scanned every page of their basically their war yearbook, mm -hmm. and uh, it validated all this stuff. Found pictures of his dad, found his dad's serial number, so we were able to make World War One. Uh, recreated uh, dog tags, all that stuff. Put all that stuff in a box, and we shipped it to our friend. And man, he looked like uh, he was in his uh, early 80s then, and he looked like he was about 12 years old on Christmas morning when <laughs> when he got to shoot his dad's gun. And and it's his, it's a, a, a treasure. But one of the other interesting things is uh, the gun was very very clean, <clears throat> and uh, and what's that's kind of rare for guns that saw combat in World War One. And the reason why is because the um, the mustard gas and Lewis mm -hmm. site was very caustic. So if that stuff got splattered on uh, the gun at all, the, it would pit. And so it's not uncommon. You've been to a lot of gun shows and seen yeah. these things walk in and the yeah. slides and, the, and and stuff are really pitted usually. You see a lot in the bayonets and particularly on the helmets <laughs> and the mess tins. Those are things that they'd be out when I guess mm -hmm. it happened. 
And so what was interesting to us was that his father's 1911 was spotless. I mean, it was in great shape, which was meant that he was a diligent soldier, that he cleaned his stuff a lot. Right. So we, because we know he had been in a lot of combat and we knew for sure he'd been gassed several times. So um, we, Bill and I took the gun down to its last part. And what was really cool was when we took the mainspring housing off and we pulled the hammer spring out we put a q-tip down there and that's where it wasn't rust it was like um it was like dust <clears throat> soil from fismet france because we hmm. know that's where his combat action was so it was really cool to see because that's probably the thing that he wouldn't have done is taken all it down to that level but yeah really really cool thing to be a part of and giving that, getting that gun back to somebody that, uh, that Dave, do you have, uh, have you gotten any uh, factory letters from Colt for your pistols? No, I need to do that. I've, uh, I've looked, I've used a lot of those really good resources that I know you guys are dead or 1911 guys are all from, uh, familiar with on the web, uh, to, to get, track my dates down, mm -hmm. but I really need to get, uh, Colt letters from. And if you have any sweetheart grips, so we don't have any, we don't have any sweetheart grips tonight. Not real ones. I had a, I do have some recreation grips, um. Because I, I, th I thought that was, we talked about that mm -hmm. <clears throat> about a week or two ago, uh, how they put that feature in Fury, and I thought that was so cool. Yeah, you can always make your own with a piece of plastic glass and a good Dremel. Yeah, so I've got, yeah, I've got some that somebody made grips, and I've just got to stick a black and white picture behind them on, on, a, on a gun. Um, what's cool is a lot of that, that uh, plexiglass glass came off a downed aircraft yep. or something. Well, that's the only place you can find it, really. Yeah, so this is my uh, CMP. This is one of my most recent recent guns that uh, I've gotten. So we've moved on now to the uh, 1911A1. 1911A1, and so you're seeing that times have changed, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, mobility now, we're, we're, we're in automobiles. Yep. So horseback isn't uh, so much a thing. So they did retain for a good while this, yeah. this large wide uh, spur hammer back here, but you start to see these narrow down over the years. Um, in the early 1920s, they did, wanted to do some design changes. Some of that was based on World War One. Some of it was based on no longer, you know, having the horseback need. So, for some reason, people thought that this needed to be elongated. You can see that's very short and hammer bite. Yep. Getting the web your your uh, hand caught in there and getting a little raspberry was was making some people whine, so they made that longer. I still got hammer bite whenever I shoot these. Actually, I do believe right here on my hand, that scar, <laughs> you can see it right there. Yeah. Yep, you can see it right there. That is that is what that is. <laughs> yeah. So the that was one of the things that changed is they made this longer. They the put a, mm -hmm. an arched mainspring housing, which, you know. I can, purchase I, or something? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, my, me personally, I prefer the flat, but I can shoot them both. I, I don't. It seems that most of the modern race guns when I have a flat, I don't. I don't. I, it seems like curve was only popular for that, and that was it. Yeah, I. I think they had the gun more right in its layout initially, um, because most of the stuff that I'm talking about here, it's like if it's going to bite you, it's going to bite you. So, um, <laughs> you know, the arched. I don't, I don't prefer eat. it. <laughs> Obviously, we don't need to have a lanyard on our magazine yep. anymore, but uh, still kept. This falls in the bottom of the jeep. <laughs> just, yeah, it'll be. Yeah, it'll be dragging around behind you somewhere. Uh, they shortened the the trigger, and they uh, checkered the front of it. They and also put they, the, yeah the dish out. And then they yeah, and then they have these crescents on both sides to to give the feel of a, a shorter trigger because the first one was long. Interesting uh, point. These are all so far all the ones that are on the screen now are all government issues. Yep. Uh, so interesting. Bill was telling me about this. Th this was actually pretty darn hard to make. Uh, even for its time back then, because the thing is, is that it's all it's all one piece, and recoil energy can make this trip the sear. Mm -hmm. So they have to get this kind of just right. So that's why a lot of people like you know we use the aluminum ones now. Um, but that's not an easy piece to make. Another interesting fact, because um, I don't have them apart, if I took these both apart and you looked up inside the slide of this one, you would see these uh, machining chatter marks in there. And the reason why that is, Bill was a, a advisor to Colt for a while, or a consultant to them. And, and this was back when they had, you know, the leather belts and the ceiling that were running the tools. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. you didn't just take a bit uh, off routinely. I mean, they kept those things on. As long as they were cutting or kind of pushing steel out of the way and you were getting the part, the shape you wanted, they kept running them because they, they weren't cheap. And uh, so you see a lot of rough, not on the outside so much, but on the inside of this gun, it's, it's pretty rough for teeth marks for the, uh, 
for the machining tools. This one, not as much. And this one was turned out, I'm sure, even faster during World War II. But watch, this is interesting. Look, watch this. The wiggle? Not very much. Not very much. So the places where it needs to fit, it fits very tight. The the barrel and uh, barrel hood to uh, slide uh, contact is really good. And I, I shot this thing, and it is accurate as hell. So this one is a rattle trap by comparison. But the inside tool marks don't look nearly as bad. So it's just interesting how things are changing over time. And also, as I'm going through these, these guns that we've all gone through right now, you know, all the way up to this last one I'm going to show you, as a gunsmith, when I take a file to, to any gun of this age, the steel to me feels like hot butter by comparison to something mm -hmm. that was made now. The steel is just so much harder now. But this was uh, your typical 1944 Remington Rand. I managed to uh, quietly get this one apart and is a very good example of your shattered uh, oh, yeah. machine marks in that one that you can see here. Try to guide them up to the... Yeah, even on the side. There, okay. In, in and here, you can see, light, see, see those V marks. I'm, I'm steering yeah. a few seconds behind, so it's kind of hard for me. You can see inside there the rough machine marks. Nothing like a, nothing like a Nagant or anything, but it's definitely rather rough. Uh, Greg, how do people get hammer bite? I've been shooting 19 minutes for 25 years and never had a ham been bit. People have fat hands. Well, yes, Greg, I do have fat hands, so thank you. Because like I showed you in the video, there is my scar right there in my hand from it. From God, that's probably 20 years old at this point. All right, so the next one I'm about to show you is a... Blown, really good recreation of. So, so before we get into it, though, mm -hmm. we've we've gone through World War One, yeah, World War Two, Korea, Korea War. Vietnam, Vietnam, and now we're into like the eighties. So yeah, nineteen uh, nineteen seventy nine to be nineteen seventy nine was so, a very good year. So yeah, it was. Um, so this gun represents the first guns that uh, uh, Delta outfitted themselves with when they stood up. So you mean Delta, you mean the U.S. Army uh, Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, the yeah. Army's elite forces stationed in Fort Bragg in North Carolina? Yeah. And so we did, uh, through the charity I'm involved with, we, we do this thing every year where we uh, focus on a rescue mission. We have a, a gala and we bring the people in that were actually involved in these missions to tell the story. We do a lot of research on it. Were the magazines serialized to, the gun, to match the guns? No, they were not. No. No. Good question, though. Yes. And speaking of which, you want to tell them about tell them about the this is World War One magazine. So I was talking, mentioning to you about how soft the steel was. This these World War One magazines were treated with what was it, arsenic or so, oh, something yeah, horrible? Yeah, yeah. It's well, the bluing is, is arsenic. So yes. So they they had to dip this in to harden it, and it discolored it. Otherwise, the lips would. Uh, would open up. Yeah, they, they wanted it to have you a little more springy. Mm. Actually, I'm glad we did this. So hold that thought. So this dimple right here on the follower has a very specific purpose. And I do not know what it is. Okay. The reason it's there, remember, it was designed to be shot on a galloping horse right. with one hand. And you can recreate this with your modern 1911 if you don't have magazines that have that dimple. Okay. And, and these round top followers are mm -hmm. getting real, or even the scallop ones are getting real popular. Um, and especially if it's like an eight round magazine, go shoot that thing one handed. And uh, and especially if you're trying to do it kind of fast, when you get to the second, the last two rounds, that's when you'll generally have a stovepipe. Okay. When you're shooting one handed, especially if you can't really, really lock it up, like you would be if you were on the back of a horse. Mm -hmm. So what this uh, dimple was for was to create enough drag on there to keep the cartridge from advancing and, and creating that stove, oh. stove pipe. And I didn't I didn't know that until I learned that from Bill. And then we... Uh, you we, show that to the camera a little closer just to yeah. take up the camera How's that? over here. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so that's the, that's the dimple. Perfect. That's the dimple mm -hmm. that generates drag on the last two rounds to slow them down so they don't go sliding out too fast. And the two-tone magazine is indicative of World War One, with mm -hmm. the 
two different styles of heat treatment so that the yep. top stayed a little more springy and the bottom stayed harder so it wouldn't deform. They had mostly figured out the uh, heat treat problems with the magazines during World War II and, and later, although there there were several, there's famous, several famous you, runs John. where uh, you go to gun shows and they're, remember back in the 70s and, and Rich Wilson wants us to remember that the 38 Special, the 38 Super was the other 1911. Mm-hmm. Mm yeah, I was just doing some research in that book that I mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of great detail and um, uh, Mike, history. You, in it. Mike, thank you for your service, obviously. And uh -huh. also, we will be featuring the Breda M9 next Saturday, I believe it is, for both a uh, with our with gunsmith. our with our gunsmith here, uh, Senior Chief Thorpe, will be talking about the care and maintenance of the M9, and then Dave will have a special follow-on video where we'll talk about the failings of the M9. Well. No, I wouldn't characterize it. Just say, definitely, we're going to talk about the issues we had with it. But I take that back. He loves it. This, nah, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting story. It's a, but it's the uh, it's the service history that uh, of the not the M9, but the Breda 92 F in uh, SEAL Team service, which is most people think they know that story and they don't. Um, so, anyways, what? So now it's 1980s. It's 1979. 1979. So Close enough. this is a representative of the guns that the guys used on Operation Eagle Claw. The attempted uh, rescue of the uh, 400, uh, the Americans that were held for 444 days in Tehran, Iran, and <clears throat> what sets this apart is theirs would have been government issue frames like the all like the ones uh, the World War II one that we just showed you. Um, they had either checkering or stippling on them, and basically what they did is they drew national match guns. So if you were a national match shooter, circa 1979, the Army had to you know. They built so many of these for match competition, and they adopted that pistol as their standard pistol. In fact, each guy was issued a couple of them. So um, the things that you see on that are, this is the skinnier, but it could have been a wide spur hammer. You've got these Bomar adjustable sights on them, and they're set up for match longer hanging over the back like this. Uh, a so, viewer would like to know if any of yours have the idiot mark on the side. No. No, I'm uh, no, not. I'm lucky. The uh, the uh, the one that was the CMP gun. I was like, oh, it's probably gonna have one, but it doesn't. Um, and the first thing, so at first glance, if you're like, oh, okay, what? How would I pick one of these out? Just at first glance, probably the the long aluminum uh, trigger stands right out to you. The the Bomar sight, the soldered on high national match front sight that. Looks like a fish hook that wants to catch in air. Now, now, what did they use for a holster for this? Not just the standard old M9 holster, right? They did, and I should have or brought... Or M1911 holster. We can do... Well, so what they did is they had... I've, I've held them. I've had the actual ones that were on that mission. Mm -hmm. So they used some Bianchi gun leather, and then they would stretch it out so that it uh, cleared this. And uh, they were also uh, fond of the uh, Bianchi um, shoulder holster, the X-15. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, I mean, I know most people probably are watching, but just give them a quick what what uh, give them the history of the operation real quick, because I don't think anyone is one hundred percent sure of what the operational names. Oh, okay. Are. So yeah, um, so there were, in nineteen seventy nine, uh, the United States Embassy in Tehran, Iran, was overrun by a bunch of re revolutionary uh, students uh, that were angry at the United States. They took all of the embassy staff uh, hostage, and. Uh, Plans were made to do a forcible rescue uh, by, you know, encroaching into Iran and downtown Tehran, uh, breaking or shooting or blowing their way into the embassy and uh, getting the hostages and, sp and spiriting them home. And ultimately, it met with failure. It was, there were some, a lot of problems. We could do a whole thing on that. Um, uh, is that the C-130s that the rockets have fought that slowed them down and all that other stuff? There was a lot of crazy tech that was developed to try to... And not tr not tested, like, I was going to be a million well, enough. Well, they tested some of it. There's some there's some stuff that hasn't seen the light of day that we, we can talk about now, and there's some stuff like the retro rockets to land it in a mm -hmm. soccer stadium. Yeah. Yeah, was, and that was nuts. But this would have been the type of gun they carried. This is the type of gun they carried with these features, so... Bomar sights, um, most of the guys like the flat mainspring, but some had the arched, um, some sort of texture. So sometimes it was this How old is that school. Done? This is done with a, um, just hitting it with like an air hammer. Oh, geez. Yeah. You, dr you drive a b -b 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 really hard air hammer on this thing and just go, go nuts. Um, the, 
has a match barrel. It's a very, very, very tight fit. Mm -hmm. And I found out from the guys that they didn't like to take theirs apart from the front, like the bushing off. They took it apart from the middle. Yeah. Um, because they wanted to try to re uh, uh, avoid taking the bushing out of the gun as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So they kind of cleaned it from the middle too. Um, these things are really, really accurate. And the other thing, they got hammer bite. So one of the things that they told me is in the early days of the unit. They had fat hands too. <laughs> people, yeah, people could tell, locals could tell that it was a special guy out in town because they shot so much every day that they all had great big scabs mm -hmm. on, their, on their shooting hands. All right, so that's... This is, and of course, this is before tactical stuff, like all the different thousand different kind of glove makers oh, and yeah, and all of this stuff. So they, I mean, yeah, probably using of, golfing gloves. They or something did, like, yeah, they, golfing, golfing gloves. That's what I thought it was. I almost missed the uh, biggest part. The biggest feature on this is this slide. So this is a national. This is a authentic, for real, new old stock that we put together. Um, national match slide. So there were a couple of uh, companies that made these national match uh, slides under contract for the government to be made into national match guns. But these were all the early unit guns had these slides as well. So you can see the spacing is a little bit wider on here and it's mm -hmm. at an angle. And this steel is hard as hell. I mean, right. we've, we have sorched some files trying to fit these things. It's just really, really, really hard steel on these slides. So they're, I think they're beautiful when they're done, but they're, they're, uh, they'll this test just, your patience. This, this, this just, whew, I'm making Yeah, it just begs. Yeah. To, so we, I had some, uh, two holsters made because I used a cross draw one and I use a, a, uh, strong side one. And, uh, I took the specs that they used and, and I had a guy make me the exact same ones. It was de desert leather out in, um, desert gun leather out in Phoenix. We'll do it. And uh, they made beautiful re recreations of those holsters that those guys use. But I had him go ahead and do the higher sight channel. So mm -hmm. this comes out really slick. So that's 1979. And then going forward. So now we're going to, this is about 1985. This is the fabled Musoc 1911. So Marine Recon wanted a 45 caliber handgun. They want M-U-S-O-C-K? They, S -O -C -K. Yeah, it's, it's M M E U, and then if, to do it correctly, you put parentheses S O C, parentheses. So it's Marine Expeditionary Unit Special Operations Capable. So this gun <clears throat> uh, is made of, is authentic as you can have a MUSOC uh, without it actually having been issued as a MUSOC. And the reason why is because this is an original GI frame that was made in 1945. Uh, yep, 45 by Colt. Uh, U.S. property marked as theirs were. I worked with these guys when uh, when I was on active duty from the late 80s through uh, recent wars. Um, and these, this is pretty much what they had, exactly. Um, the, some really unique features here. This gun retains parts that are no longer available. I don't really shoot it a whole lot these days. Uh, it shoots great. I just don't want to <laughs> risk breaking something. So like this grip safety is not available anymore. Um, I don't believe the thumb safety, uh, ambidextrous thumb safety is made anymore. The rear sight was actually made in-house at the at Quantico, at the Precision Weapon Shops by the 2112s, which are the gunsmiths that uh, put these guns together. They were all custom built, pretty much identical to each other with this millet front sight, the in-house made rear that was really, really hard. Another thing is the Marine Corps loved Barstow barrels. So they all had Barstow barrels, which this one does. A Videcki trigger, like this. And they uh, sent them with, uh, with a handful of the Wilson 7-round magazines with the base pads. And that was their service pistol for a long, long time until it started getting, uh, we started ramping up and getting more into the war, doing even more shooting. And they were like, this is getting to be a pain in the butt making these things. So they started trying to work some contract issues. Another unique feature is there were certain places, and these are all correct, where the last four numbers of the serial number were stamped so that they could keep the pieces with the gun that it belonged to if they were doing a big cleaning or something like that. So the barrel hood, the grip safety, the slide, um, all of those things were, were stamped with the last four. And this gun was made for me be before I really knew my way around gunsmithing. Now I'm really good at putting 1911s together from scratch. 
but uh, there was a guy who was really well known for doing these. He took it as a passion and he's no longer with us anymore. His name was Dave Berryhill. And this is one, if you look at, uh, if you Google around Dave Berryhill's work, if his website's still up or anything like that, uh, this one is, you'll see this one in there. I let him, you know, take as many pictures as he wanted and put them up before before I got it. And the Packmeyer grips were also what they like to use. Definitely indicative of that time frame. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're starting to see the competitive world of shooting starting mm -hmm. to leak into combat guns and then we're gonna skip a few years we, i can talk back to the years we're skipping but this is uh so that would have gun we just looked at would have been in service from like 1985 into the early 2000s or so and then this is a uh, representative of the last <clears throat> excuse me the last single stack 1911 that that delta issued dog hair dog hair yeah um, with Chris Tissue Dog here. Yeah, I was gonna say he's gonna get in the in the film one way or the other. So the last single stack uh, 45 caliber 1911 that was issued by the unit was this configuration. Um, you can look in the Vickers books. He's got some pictures of some um, either copies or original ones. Uh, there's another couple of good 1911 resources that talk about this gun. They have the parts menu. I got the parts menu from there and from some friends of mine that were there and. Um, and we put this together. So what's the designation of this one? Uh, this was issued, they started issuing this gun in 2004. Up until that point, <clears throat> the guns had either been made, were mostly made in-house by the unit armorers, but it was becoming a tax on those guys. And so they they wanted to try a different process. But which unit? Uh, Delta. Oh, okay, so. So to take some of the tax off the the armors and let them be more maintainers than uh, building, you know, like constructors of these guns. What they did is they spec'd out, by then they knew their way around the 1911 really, really well. And they knew the features that they wanted. And they had uh, several years uh, before gone to insetting the Bomar sights down into the slide and moving it forward a little bit. So it's not hard to imagine why they, they brought it down into the slide to reduce that, that high profile like that. And then you can go with more of a standard height front sight. But the going forward is because of the, at the uh, adoption of the Safari Land th uh, 3004 and later 6004 holsters that had the thumb break on them. And what was happening is the ears of this, when it come, came back all the way even, would catch on that when you were trying to roll it forward. And so just by moving this this much more forward, they were able to have um, effective clearance of that time, time and time again. Um, so this is a really cool gun. So they, they spec'd out the slide and the frame from Caspian and they wanted a cart barrel. And again, the Bomars are, are a feature and a lot of the smaller parts are, are Wilson parts. And they wanted, they wanted a company to build it. And so they went to, uh, Springfield Armory when Dave Williams ran the custom shop and they said, listen, would you guys be open to building a gun if it's not your gun mm -hmm. for us? Like for like a like hundred or so of them. And, and if you ever knew Dave Williams, freaking awesome dude, master 1911 pistol smith. And they took it up. They said, yeah. And I think it was a great move. Um, definitely uh, freed up the unit armors to do more maintenance stuff. Um, but what a cool collaboration, right, for Springfield Armory. And I, to my knowledge, I don't think Springfield Armory ever crowed about that and said, hey, we were the guys that built this. But And and I actually, I know the people at Caspian, and they don't really talk too much about their part in it, but it was a really good collaboration. Thank you, Brian, for your donation. Does anybody have any questions about the, this one? Yeah, again, questions, please ask them here. I mean, I've been trying to answer them the best I can. We have had questions I've been able to answer, so I've been keeping them off. So now what are we getting into? Now, I'm going to show you some guns uh, that were mine that I actually used uh, on deployment. So some of you had asked before if uh, any of these guns had a known history or were actually, you know, used in service. Now, these were Dave's personal weapons that he'll talk about here. Some of them definitely look like they've been a few miles. Yeah. So this first one is a, uh, it's a Springfield Armory 1911 and the back story on this, it's got all sorts of modifications on it. And none of these are as nice as what I do Ugh, these ouch. days. Yeah. <laughs> it's when you don't, when you know your hands are going to be wet. Yeah. Um, 
I had this gun pulled out of a case and uh, quickly modified and sent to me uh, days after the famous Black Hawk Down Operation Gothic Serpent mm -hmm. deal. And the reason why is because uh, I was spooled up to go over that direction immediately after an augment. So we had some seals over there. So I knew I was heading in that direction and we just started getting the the after action reports back that were the handwritten experiences of the guys. And one thing was a common theme is guys were talking down. They said the nine millimeter doesn't stop anybody. So they're all, they're all fucked up but on the, cotton. But the 45, yeah. <laughs> the 45 had authority. And I went, oh right. no, I don't have one. So we were talking about SFOD first. That's an <laughs> army side. Obviously now we've transitioned mm -hmm. to talking about, you know, Naval Special Warfare's use of the 1911 and, and talking about Gothic Serpent. So that's the early 90s, right? It was, uh, yeah, 93. 93. So Black Hawk Down, Mogadishu, Somalia. So I carried, so I deployed in uh, very early January of 94. Uh, we went that direction. And as things developed in the world on our way back, there was unrest in Haiti. We got home, we touched base. You know, we'd gone for six months. We were home for like a week or two and spun back around and I find myself in Haiti. So this was the gun that I uh, I carried over the beach in, in Haiti in 1994. So that was the whole Papa Doc thing or Baby Doc and the... Yeah, it was yeah. going to be bad. I mean, they, we were really going to go in there heavy handed. And thank then, you, Chris. Uh, you know, uh, thank, I guess thankfully on their side, we bribed the right person and cooler heads prevailed. And so then it went in as a more, uh, a much more peaceful uh, invasion, but an invasion nonetheless. And with the memories of what had happened the year before, guys being drugged through the streets and all like that, I think I had 100 rounds of. <laughs> I had a lot of 45 ammo, and, and that's besides what I carried for my primary on me, because I figured if it uh, gets that bad, uh, where we were going was very densely populated. And I was like, if it gets that bad, they're going to have to shovel my body out of a pile of brass to drag me through the streets. All right, so that was 94 or so. Pre-9-11, another pre-9-11 gun here. I was competing, limited competition quite a bit. And I still like the uh, 45 ACP. A lot of guys were going to 38 Super and, you know, 40 Smith & Wesson, but I always shot uh, 45 ACP. I had this custom gun built. It's a double stack, and believe it or not, this thing ran awesome. Awesome. That looks like it's seen some miles, though. And it has definitely seen some miles of uh, training and operations. So I deployed with this in 97, through the winter of 97, 98. Um, got some free falls on this, on this gun, on some training exercises we did uh, with some guys in Spain. And uh, it, yeah, it was pretty awesome gun. Don't shoot it that much these days, but I sure shot it a lot back then. Jim Griffith says that this is absolutely amazing. You guys are great. Cool. Thanks for saying so. All right, this is a post 9-11 deployer. Um, Complete with sand. Well, that's actually that movie magic dust. It oh, was, yes, I forgot. It was in a, featured in a movie, Star was, of Stage and Screen. Yeah, it was, in a, it was in a movie, and this is the, the blown up dust stuff from that movie, and I have just left it on there because I haven't been shooting it. When I go to, when I go to shoot it again, I'll, I'll get all that stuff off of there. Um, this gun, I had had this, um, this Series 80 uh, Colt, and it was a it was a really cool gun, but I ran on some unique features, and I don't know, it's almost like I was precinct. I wanted to, I was, I knew I was going to be going on deployment, starting in September of two thousand one. So the months before that, I commissioned somebody to build me a gun that had this special coating on it that I could get it in seawater and it wouldn't rust, but I didn't want it to look like chrome. Mm. So there were only a handful of places that could do that, and then I wanted one of these Smith and Alexander magazine wells for fast reloads, but I wanted to have a lanyard loop on it because I knew I would be doing stuff on the ocean and I wanted to have a lanyard to retain it. No horses? What's that? No horses? No, no horses, <laughs> no. <laughs> and so this uh, this is what came out of that. And uh, this is one of my, and these grips were pretty cool too. So there's one of the magazines, I was using a lot of Chip McCormick magazines around this time with the face pads on them. This gun was uh, with me when I deployed days after 9-11. It was uh, used on one of the two ship boardings that we did um, where we crept up on a ship at night and, and took it down hard looking for uh, bin Laden's kids. Um, 
yeah, and then this was back with me again in Iraq in 2004, and this was the gun that was actually on my hip when I was uh, combat wounded in, in Iraq, uh, in Baghdad, in August of 2004. So, so they had asked earlier for a gun that was actually used in combat. Well, there you go. Obviously, mm -hmm. several different theaters, several different operations, and was with you when you were wounded. Yep. Yep. In fact, this one had to stay because I got sent medivac back, medevac yeah. back, and so my buddies took this uh, off of me and brought it back when, when they returned a month or two later. Like you, like you. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, this one is kind of an interesting story. So I retired in 2007 and I went to work for the Army Research Laboratory and I was issued a gun exactly like this. This is the Springfield Armory Marine Corps operator. And so I had a choice of a SIG uh, 226 or this and I, I chose this. So I deployed to Iraq uh, with those guys and Naval Special Warfare um, as a, I guess, contracted contractor but mm. uh, you know working working for the government and uh had had uh, my issue version of this with me in 2009 so yeah so the i think the what would surprise most people is the 1911 has had a much longer service life or yeah you or think like, you know, the life. Beretta came along in the 80s and that was it for it yeah but. not so much and it's funny they stick out um you know, when you're in a war zone and you're going into a, a mess facility and I can't tell you how many times somebody, hey, your hammer's back. Like that was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I know. It, I know why it's back. All right. Any uh, more questions? Yes. Yeah, anyone have any questions or I want to see any other parts again? I mean, we definitely have a bunch of stuff here to show. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just thinking time-wise and historically-wise, I mean, it's amazing that, you know, we jumped literally from this to all of those and that's what stayed around you know for a very long time so you know john moses knew what he was doing of course this was well it's you know i think it's yeah. fun to look at he did on the on the engineering the mechanical engineering side because he beat the his his rival in the uh competition which was a offering by savage what's interesting is that the need was driven by performance uh, based on what they experienced in the philippines and then all that stuff they did in the stockyards in Chicago, that, that basically was, convinced them. It's it's worth reading there, uh, that. Some yeah, bodies hung up from the ceiling. Hey, <laughs> the Lagarde Thompson. So uh, Le, Le, um, both were colonels. Good. Okay, so well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just had a whole flurry of questions. Oh, okay. All right. First question: What is, in your opinion, the best iteration of all of these? Oof. He votes for the Unit Caspian. Yeah, I I, I really like the last. Um, uh, Caspian that the unit put out there. I'm also fond. There's one that, that kind of is in the sandwich between the early unit gun and that one, and it was before they had the rails, mold, you know, milled into the to the frame. There's so that would be like circa 1989, you know, around the time right. that uh, Acid Gambit happened and stuff, because it had some of those features, uh, but they hadn't gotten to like how to hang a light on it that you know. What was the what was the Magwell again on the previous series eighty gun that you showed? Oh, uh, Smith and Alexander. Smith and Alexander is the correct answer. That. Yeah. Is that the one you're looking for? And you can select. Uh, they have thin ones, which I don't recommend. I would go with the the full size one. Um, they have thin ones. They have the regular size. As far as the width, <laughs> they have arched. Uh, they have it's checkered. Smith and Alexander. Mm -hmm. And they have some that are have no stippling on them, so that you can do whatever you want to do on them. All right. And we also have. Oh, I'm going back to the beginning. Okay. Um, who builds the best 1911 today? Nighthawk. Um. I uh, no. No. Who builds the best 1911? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, Cylinder and Slide builds a fantastic uh, 1911. Who was that again? Cylinder and Slide. Cylinder yep. and Slide? Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, there's there's a bunch of companies out there. I think the guy, the, the thing is the guys are all getting older. The guys that are really, really good have kind of started to hang up their aprons a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, with everybody going to plastic guns and that's, that's the rave right now, I fear that we're losing that, um, that craftsmanship, you know, having a gunsmith that really knows his way around a gun. I mean, the thing is, I don't think we're going to be sitting here looking at hundred year old Glocks and drooling over. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Um, uh, I love I love the finger groove. The finger groove was hated by everybody. Oh, it was so great. I mean, I just don't. Uh, they just won't. They're not going to last like that. I mean, you might be looking at the slide. But, what uh, holster did you carry when you used the double stack? I used a. I had a six thousand and four that I uh, Safari Land six thousand and four that I took a heat gun and I slightly heated up the one side so I could get retention because this is a little wider right here. And then it slid in just fine and held them all. Nice. Anybody else? One second. Okay. No, that looks like it. Okay. Still got a lot of people out there looking though. So again, we're here <clears throat> for you. Any other questions? Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Um, any other questions anyone happens to have? I mean, every U.S. military 1911 that has ever been used is out here, including all these rare ones. I mean, to be honest with you, I thought I knew a lot, and I, I, I was clearly baffled by a lot of this stuff. So there's two I don't have examples of. Uh, huh. I guess three special okay. ones, like the special operations. Well, ones, there's like the, the, Marine, the, the Marine Corps. So the, Mar the Marine Corps had two. Right. So they had, um, you know, not counting the one I just showed you. So... They had the MUSOC pistol, but then they they were deciding, do we want to be in SOCOM or not? And so they stood up a, a temporary unit called Marine Corps SOCOM Debt 1, and to outfit those guys, they wanted 1911s, and, and they just, at the speed that they were going to get these guys stood up, it wasn't practical to have the precision weapon shop gin up a bunch of guns for them and keep, you know, the fleet of guns and, the, and force recon going. So what they did is they went to Kimber... And they got Kimber to build them a gun, which was designated the ICQB, which means uh, interim CQB pistol. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people think it's the same as the, what you need? Let's see that one. This? Right yep, right there. A lot of people think it's the same as the uh, Kimber Warrior. It's not. It has um, had a lot of other features that they spec'd on it. Um, I served with those guys. I was in Iraq with those guys and got to handle their guns in 2004. And uh, it was a pretty good gun. And some of those leaked out on the uh, commercial market. Those are, I mean, if you have one in your collection, don't get rid of it unless you really need a lot of cash. Um, then the other one is the M45. So uh, when they when they finally did disband that organization and stand up MARSOC, MARSOC wanted to retain a 1911. They went to Colt. Colt developed the M45. And as late as a couple years ago, they still had them because I was... I was training uh, marksmanship in the shooting package for... Uh, what type of uh, ammunition did you typically use when you were out? Ball. That's a great question. So it goes back to, <clears throat> you know, when you say, well, you could carry a SIG if you wanted. You could carry a 1911. It depended on the mission that we were going to do and if I needed, really needed to uh, have ammo interchangeability. If that wasn't really as, as big a factor, I tended to go with the 1911 because... 230 grains is still, you know, and 45 caliber is still 230 grains and 45 caliber. And the ball 9 mil round isn't going to get any bigger. So you basically had, uh, you know, a lot bigger cross-sectional uh, diameter to crush tissue. Um, you know, nine, 980 feet per second. It's not slowing down real fast. The other thing I liked about it is I, I found that the 1911, and, and when we go into the do you ever do the Mark 23 thing, the SOCOM pistol? 45 in the woods, in the brush, when you're in a hide site, is actually pretty great because it'll punch through your hide site material. Mm -hmm. Whereas a high velocity CAR 15 or, you know, your M4 or something might hit a, you know, part of your hide uh, building material deflect and deflect. Much, yeah. Yeah. Um, see, Mike says that he was in a museum recently and he saw a slide that was uh, damaged by um, some kind of artillery or flak from, it was on a B-17 gunner who had it and he had it in his, obviously it's in, in his survival vest, you carry one in your survival vest. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the 1911 was definitely capable of stopping a piece of shrapnel or <laughs> any other flying projectiles. How many rounds, um, great presentation, how many rounds did the original magazines hold? Seven. Seven. 
That was one of the six things. So, yes. uh, so one of the requirements was that it had to hold that the Lagarde and Thompson came up with is that it had to hold at least six rounds. So seven was was extra. Did you have personally any trouble wearing different types of gloves on operations using the 1911, or did you have to cut the fingers off? No, you know, oddly, I I uh, I'm one of those guys that didn't. I don't have anything against cutting the fingertips off, but well, I didn't. Okay. Um, I just wore them out. Right. Um, so no, and I used my favorite. Uh, well, I had several favorite, but the Oakley ones with the hard knuckle protectors mm -hmm. were ones that I used quite a bit. Um, some mechanics wear gloves. Um, yeah. That were a little simpler. I use those a lot. Yeah. No, Good. no golf gloves. No, I didn't, but the unit guys did. They still had theirs. I remember there's one. I used batting gloves. Yeah, Franklin. That. Franklin, yeah. Franklin batting gloves. I remember that yeah. whole thing. Yeah, I used to go right up here at Lynn Haven Mall to the whatever the sporting goods store was before some, Dick's. Some Ken Griffey Jr. Batting I know. Gloves. And they had, when they had the sticky ones, that was great for rain days when I was teaching. Yep, 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 yep. Um, if you're going to have a failure with a 1911, what is it probably going to be the culprit of it? As far, as far as a malfunction or, or like a parts break? A malfunction, a, a, a failure to fire. Uh, I think stove piping is probably the most common. Right. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why for that. So uh, one, like the thing I just told you, uh, if you guys have these guns or you know somebody has them, go out and get a magazine that doesn't have the dimple on the follower and uh, and one that does and do some one-handed shooting and, and you'll probably surprise yourself that a gun that otherwise runs reliably uh, especially when you get in like a oh I'm I'm a hurt I'm hurt position or something you don't have a really solid body position behind it you're just kind of getting the sights lined up and firing that's when you'll see that happen. Um, I was thinking about the last scene in Saving Private Ryan where Tom Hanks is laying yeah, on like the that. bridge <laughs> yeah like you that. know and he's like ah, and you can tell <laughs> the, the gun is I mean I don't know if he was milking it for the camera yeah, probably but it I, I swear like you know you Saving Private Ryan was notorious for. Uh, what I call blanks and grands, mm -hmm. where you know, pop, 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 and the round doesn't, the gun doesn't move at all. But in that end, like he's just every time he pulls that trigger, that gun just flies like three feet. Yeah. I, I was wondering, like maybe they put live ammunition in just for that scene, just to, to get the actual knockback of it. But, but yeah, I mean, it's not horrible. But yeah, it's when you see it, you're like, hey, you, you should love him. I get, you know, I get him in the shop all the time. He's three hundred mm -hmm. pound men that come in here, like, why is this gun jam? I say, oh, you're limp wristing it, and they go, I'm what? I'm like. <laughs> It's just a technical term. I'm not calling you anything. I'm just saying. Yeah. We know. So you bring this up in the movies. So I'm I'm one of these jerks like you that looks for all the details. And yeah, the, the ruin movie. everything. So when I see a uh, a show that purposely like, okay, we're having this this 1911 is here because we want you to look at the 1911 and they're firing blanks. You'll 100 percent of the time you'll see that it's a nine millimeter conversion. If you see the barrel, you'll you'll yeah. notice that it's uh, smaller. But usually on the right-hand side, they've got an external extractor as well. Mm -hmm. It's another uh, modification that they do to make the movie blanks run. Right. Yeah, I mean, being a longtime reenactor myself, like, you could never get 1911 to run blanks ever. Mm -hmm. It was always iffy, you know. That was funny. So um, one of my favorite movies, a movie with, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, Craig Sheffer and Don Johnson called In Pursuit of Honor. Mm-mm. It's about, um, it's a, well, they say it's fictitious. Or they, the movie says it's a true story, but... You know, the army says no, where they are in, tasked with uh, killing all of the remounts for the cavalry in between the wars. Oh, yeah. No, and, I and, see, that's and, a great And they movie. steal yeah. the horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because when they go to execute, like, five of the horses that have, you know, become too injured to go on, you can tell John Johnson is having a hell of a time with this 1911 to get it to work. So he has to manually work the slide every yeah. time to shoot the, shoot the horses. So, yep. Can get the blank adapter to work. <laughs> well, I'm digging this this uh, new series, 1923, because every, yes, all, every, good guys and bad guys are all carrying 1911s. So. Yeah, but it's, the neat thing about it is, like, you see, and I love this movie or the TV show because you see that change over mm -hmm. in weaponry where it's going from lever actions and six shooters to 1911s and Tommy guns. In fact, the very wow. first episode where Harrison Ford gets shot to pieces with the Thompson. Mm -hmm. You see the guy pull up in the car and it's like, oh, okay, whatever. And then I see all that case. I'm like, uh oh, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. just got bad. And he hoses the whole the whole Dutton clan with it. Yeah. Of course, the 45 is a devastating round, especially in a submachine gun. Mm-hmm. Angry bumblebees. All right. Any, all right. Anybody else? We're at over an hour. Any other questions? If not, this is gonna be it for us. But we had a great show tonight. I appreciate all of you coming out. We had a great interaction. Lots of good questions. Again, this video will be available to watch on the channel here at any one given time. And um, 
I don't know if we're gonna recut this down and put it on YouTube or if we're just gonna film a new one for YouTube with less less brevities. But that's all forthcoming. Um, keep on the page to see our new coming up events. There's a couple new ones coming on. For those of you who enjoyed the Jeep photographs yesterday, keep an eye out for that. We're gonna make that a regular series of what's the Jeep doing this month. Hopefully it's doing something and not sitting in the driveway. Mm. And um, yeah, just hang on out there. Remember, so every share, every like, every post, every comment counts for us. Of course, you can also uh, donate using stars. And we are also on Patreon as well. Um, we actually just finished a whole uh, episode where we went out to the JROTC ball here le lately and um, did a series with them. You can join us on Patreon and support us through there. And there's also lots of great content on Patreon. Or if you're ever in Virginia Beach, if you're ever in Virginia Beach and want to come by and visit, we're here open uh, five days a week from 11 to 5. If you have any questions, you can always drop us a direct message on Facebook and communicate that way. Particularly a lot of people have a lot of questions about their gun maintenance, their historical facts, anything else like that. So without any other questions, I will bid you fond adieu, and uh, from Dave and I here, I hope everyone enjoyed our presentation tonight. Looks like we did. Had a good shot. And I'll see you all later. Three, two, one. I got to find the finish button. There it is.